Welcome to Monash University uh, and for joining us for the first Monash University Health and Physical Education uh, Seminar for the year, uh, proudly hosted by us, Monash University and also ACHPA Victoria. Uh, my name is Laura Alfrey, I'm the courses leader for Health and Physical Education here at Monash. Um, Bernie, would you like to come up and uh, introduce yourself? Thanks, Laura. Yeah, my name's Bernie Holland. I'm the professional learning manager for ACHPA Victoria, which, if you don't know what that stands for, it's the Australian <coughs> Council for Health, Physical Education and Recreation. And when you are, those of you who, there may be some health and PE teachers in here, but those of you who are teaching in primary or secondary school, our role is to support you in the teaching of health and physical education. And so we... We're partnering with and supporting Monash in this throughout the year. If you do have uh, any questions about us or want to find out about it, I, our web link was on the website or you could see me after today and I'm gladly share anything with you. So, for example, we've got a, a primary health and PE conference in June uh, where there would be a, things uh, across the whole curriculum and I'd be more than happy to, to share with you about that. So, thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, um, the, the people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I've been in Australia about 10 years. You can probably tell I'm not a local. <laughs> um, but I've really enjoyed um, taking the opportunity to learn about Australian Indigenous culture and knowledge and practices. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm also learning how to use a microphone. Um, tonight we've got a large number of people in the room, so thank you again for coming. Um, we've also got um, a, a significant number live streaming, so welcome to the live streamers. And we also have uh, about 60 or 70 that have requested uh, access to the video um, because they couldn't attend. Um, I'm not telling you this to brag, I'm telling you because it tells us that there's a thirst for support around teaching sexuality and relationships education and um, ACHPA Victoria and Monash HPE are really happy to be able to support you in that endeavour. So, um, in terms of what's happening tonight, our resident expert... Dr. Deba Fotopoati um, is going to uh, present some contemporary ideas around sexuality and relationships education, specifically in uh, primary schools. She's going to um, encourage discussions around three key themes. And apologies if I'm stepping on your toes here, Debbie. Fine. Saving your voice. You can keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first of those three key, uh, three key, three key themes um, is around addressing sensitive topics in schools and classrooms. Uh, the second theme being considering some key sexuality and relationship education debates. Um, and the third theme um, will provide an opportunity for you to explore your own experiences around teaching sexuality and relationship education. Um, at the end of this, the intention is that you'll develop knowledge, skills and understanding around sexuality and relationships education in primary schools. Mm -hmm. um, and that ultimately you will leave today with some concrete examples of what sexuality education can look like in your school tomorrow. That's our aim. Um, so Debbie's going to present and then that will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers, depending on, on uh, how much time we have. Um, so please hold on to your burning questions and we'll hopefully have, or we'll have time for them at the end. So without further ado, thank you, Debbie. Thank you all. And let's go. I've got, uh, I'm wired up. Okay. I'm wired for sound. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, can I just get a bit of a feel for um, in, the, in the room? Um, and I'm not sure if people can um, chat about... Uh, who are online about so how many people are here uh, working in schools as teachers at the moment? So quite a number, okay. And students? And, okay, so lots of students, welcome. And um, outside organisations that maybe support schools in terms of their health and physical education. So a few people there. So um, what I'd really like is that um, if there's things that you can contribute from your experiences either as teachers in schools or from being on placements or from being uh, agencies that work alongside schools in terms of sexuality and relationships education to please um, feel free to uh, contribute to the discussion at the end of the session. So... 
Um, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, acknowledge actually Dr. Rosie Welsh, who's sitting at the table over there, because uh, this presentation that I'm doing today builds on a presentation that Rosie and I did together uh, last year with our Masters of Teaching and Learning uh, students in Health and Physical Education, of which there is one sitting in the room, so she's critiquing me, maybe, I don't know. Um, so yes, I wanted to acknowledge Rosie's work in this um, I also want to take the time to um, acknowledge the amazing number of people in Victoria who have contributed to the area of sexuality and relationships education over a number of years. People like Debbie Ollis, Lynn Harrison, um, Lynn Hillier, Jenny Walsh, uh, Maria Pilotta Ciaroli, Dina Lehi, Mary Lou Rasmussen, Kath Albury, Lisa Hunter, and, and many, many more. So we've just got these incredible uh, researchers and scholars that are, have been working in this area for a really long time. In terms of uh, my relationship with sexuality and relationships education, I've been a health and PE teacher for 35 years. I'm still a healthy health and PE teacher. I just happen to teach tertiary students now. And it has been an, uh, an absolute um, blessing to be part of that, this arena for so many years. Sexuality has been an area that I've been particularly interested in for a long time. Um, when my daughter was uh, first at school, her teacher asked her, what does your mummy do? And she said, my mum's the sex and drugs lady. <laughs> so you can imagine how that went down. I was wondering what on earth my job was. <laughs> so yes, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, my PhD was looking at, um, was talking to young people who are 15 to 24 and asking them the question of what kind of sexuality education would they have liked when they were at school, now that they were a little bit older and starting to move into adult life. And as you can imagine, they had lots to say uh, about that. But one of the key things that they said was that they felt that adults had actually really let them down, that their teachers and their parents had not been brave enough to tell them some of the things that would have been really useful to know about sexuality and about relationships that they try to navigate as adults. And so I think by you coming today, um, you are uh, signalling that as adults that you are thinking about this and you are thinking how do we navigate this in a safe way for ourselves but also as a safe way for our children. And because of the way that sex ed versus sexuality ed, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, um, has been posited in society. I think this is one of the reasons that there's this tension um, and concern and this sort of dangerous place that um, can we put sexuality and relationships education into a school setting with young children. And so I hope that what I've put together today, um, it was a little bit tricky not knowing exactly what the, who the audience would be about what would be um, the right mix, but I'm hoping that what I've put together um, is useful to you. So, um, in thinking about what we're going to cover over the next 45, 50 minutes or so, um, my hope is that at the end of this session that you'll understand the context of primary sexuality and relationships education in, in Victoria, that you'll develop some confidence if you haven't already. I'm sure there's people with plenty of confidence in the room um, who are already doing some sexuality and relationships education, but maybe if you haven't got that confidence just yet, there's lots of students in the room, that this will give you a bit more confidence about how you might approach um, this context. And oh, I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to really think about our own values and beliefs in terms of sexuality and relationships education and where those have come from as we, as we go through the session. I might say that sexuality and relationships education is quite a mouthful, and so I'll probably just resort to sexuality education. But I want you to uh, be mindful of the fact that relationships in there um, brings a different understanding to the, to the context that we're trying to talk about in terms of um, a lot of people, when they hear the word sexuality, just hear the first three letters of the word, <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> so um, I might uh, do that, and also that I've had uh, a, a very nasty illness for the last few days, and my voice might disappear, and I might need to have a drink at some stage. <clears throat> so let's go. So the first thing I want to do with you is read a little story. 
And as I read the story to you, I want you to be thinking about and noticing the thoughts that you have as I read the story, whether there's any bodily reactions to the story as I read it, or any feelings of discomfort. Okay? So just get yourself comfortable, and I'm going to read a little story. It was that time of the evening, just before dark. The house was empty except for the two of them. As they lay together entwined in a warm embrace, this room, this bed, was the universe. She stroked the nape of his neck. He nuzzled her erect nipple, first gently with his nose, then licked it, tasted, smelled, and absorbed her body odour. It was a hot and humid January day, and they had been perspiring. Slowly he caressed her breast as he softly rolled his face over the contours of the other. He pressed his body close against her side and, fully satisfied, closed his eyes and soon fell into a deep, relaxed sleep. Ever so slowly, she slipped herself out from underneath him for fear she would disturb him. She cradled him in her arms and then moved him to his cot. Having completed his early evening feed, this four-month-old had just experienced another step in his ongoing sexuality development, development of sexuality. So just in your, table, uh, in your tables or online, just um, you can um, chat uh, in, the, in the box there. As I was reading that, what was your response? What were you thinking when I was reading that? Did you have any kind of reaction in your body? And it's like, holy heck, what have, what have I got myself into here? Um, <laughs> was there any level of discomfort? So just have a little chat and think about why. Just going to give you 30 seconds. Thanks. So lots of immediate discussion, which tells me that people perhaps weren't thinking about the story in the way that it was leading. Was it, would that be a fair... Um, yes, there's lots of nods. So perhaps it was that you were bringing your adult understandings to that story that a child wouldn't... But Because adult, as adults, we've had experiences and we, and we have knowledge that children don't have. And so one of the key messages of that story is that sexuality begins from the time that we are born and continues throughout our lifespan. And then if we can recognise that children have sexuality, it can also be recognised that maybe we can have an influence on that sexuality by being their teachers and parents in the kinds of spaces that we're talking about in terms of education. Yeah? Okay. So I'm just going to introduce you to the team that does the sexuality and relationships education of children. So you see the child there, parents, friends, media, uh, community agencies and the school. And so in terms of thinking about sexuality and relationships education from a schooling perspective, what we see straight away is that we're just one piece of this educative team that children learn about sexuality and relationships from multiple places. While we all play our part, and sometimes we don't necessarily want to be um, on the team with some of the other participants, they're there anyway. Okay, We can't um, st stop a child from being influenced by these many different things that are surround them. The most valuable learning about sexuality comes from the home. This is the chance for parents to really um, explain and, and, and um, teach young people around their own values and beliefs. But what we know is that parents sometimes feel unsure about how to go about that, quite what to say and how to say it, whether it's just one, do we just wait till a certain age or when is the right time? Um, and they're also worried about maybe they might say the wrong thing. <clears throat> and so, as a team of people working together about supporting children, we need to give them the skills to be able to navigate the kinds of uh, teaching that is coming from all of these different members of the team, don't we? And so when we look at the Victorian curriculum in HPE, 
There's three topics um, that are identified as needing to be handled sensitively, and sexuality and relationships is one of them. We've also got violence prevention and mental health. Um, today we're talking about sexuality and relationships, but of course there's a connection with violence prevention as well and gender-based violence and um, the respectful relationships kinds of uh, uh, teaching that is also going on in school. But also there's connection to mental health. And so none of these things sit in isolation of each other. They are interconnected. Um, and, and the way our mental health plays out in our lives can indeed impact on the kinds of relationships that we have. Yes? So when we think about the kinds of um, sensitive and controversial topics that there are, here's some of them, and when we think about sexuality and relationships education, the ones in red are um, directly involved. But in terms, of, um, in terms of thinking about sexuality and relationships education, th alcohol and drug use, um, body image, conservation, uh, these are all kind of interconnected in the way that we think about uh, sexuality and relationships education. <clears throat> so why should we teach sexuality and relationships education? I'm just going to um, just read a little bit here because I'm worried about uh, <laughs> forgetting some of the things that I've put in here. Um, children are exposed to much more than we were at the same age. Technology's played a really big um, part in the way that young people learn about things in, these, in this day and age. So we've got social media impacting um, and, there's, and young people with digital devices where their, their parents or their caregivers don't necessarily know what they're looking at and, and, uh, and what spaces they're going into. Things like music videos, um, advertising, uh, those kinds of things are pretty pervasive. Children have access to so much more than we ever did. And, and when I was growing up, we had to work really hard to try and find anything at all around sex or sexuality. We had to find out somebody who had a magazine or something like that that we might have to find a way to be able to sneak a look at. To, in today's day and age, you can find things by mistake. In fact, it's really hard to avoid um, a lot of the information that's out there. <clears throat> So with the, with the internet being so accessible, we have to make sure that teachers and parents are accessible as well. What we know is that with a comprehensive whole school sexuality education program that provides consistent and accurate information to young people right from an early age, from foundation, um, and that is respectful of diversity, can contribute significantly to students' lives. The research is showing clearly that this makes a difference in enabling young people to make uh, decision, decisions later on in their lives when they've got those foundational skills. So at the primary level, uh, a quality and a comprehensive sexuality and relationships education program has been shown to increase children's personal safety uh, increase their confidence and their self-esteem, and to make children feel better able to make decisions as they grow older. And surely those are all things that both parents and teachers would want for students. When we look at the curriculum, uh, the curriculum focuses on building knowledge, skills and behaviours to make responsible and safe choices. I think the, the, it's, it's just so important that it's not just knowledge, that we have to give children the ability to be able to practice the skills that they, uh, to apply the knowledge that they're learning. That we have to give them multiple uh, situations where they can practice the skills that they might need in real life, but in a safe place in a classroom. Because they're going to get it wrong sometimes while they're learning, like any of us, okay? So um, when we look at the kinds of things that you will teach at different levels, you will see that there is a, um, a spiral effect that happens, just like every other curriculum where we, 
where we connect with different um, contexts multiple times and getting more sophisticated as we go in terms of the skills and the knowledge um, that children learn. When we look at the kinds of contexts that we might be thinking about in sexuality and relationships education, we're talking about ideas such as love, safer sex, but we're not talking with sex about sex with five-year-olds, I promise you, we're not doing that. Um, we are thinking about the ways that we might choose to live our lives and our futures on a, in multiple different ways. The kinds of people that we want to be around, our personal rights, our rights as a... Uh, um, uh, in terms of what, what expectations and responsibilities do we have when we connect with other people, uh, in terms of our relationships, both platonic and maybe as you're getting older um, in an intimate uh, space, thinking about managing risk, uh, thinking about how to manage if we don't want to be around somebody, how do we navigate that? How do we say we don't want to be friends with you anymore? Because those skills that we learn at a primary school level when we say actually we don't like it when you uh, treat me like this, I don't want to be with you anymore, translates into relationships that are of a more intimate nature at a, at a higher level at uh, high school. <clears throat> and the fact that um, sexuality and relationships education is one of the core um, learning and teaching responsibilities that schools are expected to teach. And I think what has been happening is that because it is seen as a bit dangerous and a bit scary that schools have been dodging this and um, working in other ways in terms of uh, not wanting to go there in some, in some instances because, or always um, outsourcing their um, sexuality and relationships education because they're nervous about doing it for themselves. What we do know is that it's very rare that teachers actually get any specialist um, training and professional development in terms of um, health and physical education as well in the primary school situation. And so, you know, there's really there's room for lots of support in terms of um, upskilling. So what I'd like you to do um, is just think for a moment. What is the difference between sex education and sexuality and relationships education? So just take a moment to think about that through. And when you've had a chance to think it through, talk about it in your um, group. If you're online, maybe you can um, pop something into the chat box about your ideas around the difference between sex education as it was known when I went to school, and maybe some of you when you went to school, although there's some young people here, so maybe it wasn't, um, and what sexuality and relationships education is. What's the difference? I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay. I don't know, Laura, have you got your um, microphone there? She's busy involved in a conversation. So, um, ideas, what's the difference between sex education and sexuality education? Do you want to leap around with your microphone? Yeah. Come on. You didn't think you are just sitting here swanning around having a nice time, did you? Anyone? Sex education versus sexuality? Anybody? No? Okay. Thanks, Sapna. Yay. Uh, we were talking about fact that with sex education it's literally just about the act of sex and that's what we all had when we were in school whereas now sexuality in relationships is broader talking about respectful dealings how to be intimate and all of all of that that comes with it before and after okay thank you anything different you've got a uh, yep Yep, I've got some people online, um, so there's a few different opinions. One of them is sex education is about the act of sex, um, whereas sexuality and relationship education is about the sexual sexuality continuum and where one stands on it. Right, lovely. I'm sure there's lots of things that anybody bursting to say anything different. Okay, thanks for that. Brilliant. So um, sexuality and sexuality education means different things to different people, but there's something that we all agree on uh, in terms of thinking about um, sexuality is that it's not just about biology. And so in our old, uh, old school ideas about sex education are, you know, um, 
you know, very much uh, reproductive and the act of sex. So um, sexuality is, is related to but distinct from sex, okay? Uh, and, and Sapna, you mentioned that. Uh, it's related to but distinct from gender, and gender is around the social and cultural distinctions between men and women. And the other thing around sexuality is, is as, a, as, a, as a topic that we teach in um, schools or in other spaces, is that there is a tension between the acceptance of diversity and the established norms of, of the community, and I think that contributes to some of the the, the feelings of um, being unsure about teaching it because we, we, we don't want to upset parents and so um, th there's some of those, those issues there. Louisa Allen, she's an academic at the University of Auckland and um, <clears throat> she talks about how uh, sexualities are discursively constituted through the social institutions um, that, we, that we are all part of and they've all been influenced historically and culturally in different ways. And so she <coughs> argues that uh, in terms of a contemporary Western understanding of sexuality, that um, those understandings are shaped by discourses of things like privacy, shame, guilt, danger and pleasure. Um, and, and, th and all of those connect in complex and, and difficult ways. And, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of the missing discourse of pleasure that we're not actually ever supposed to talk about um, things from a sex-positive um, space when we are working with young people. And this idea that um, sexuality is something private means that when we try to... Um, address sexuality and relationships education in a public arena such as a school, it means that sometimes um, there's that potential for people being uncomfortable and this makes it a difficult and sometimes dangerous place <coughs> to place yourself when you are thinking about doing this teaching. Um, and so many schools, uh, schooling approaches actually seek to conceal or contain sexual sexuality ideas and issues in schools rather than actually explore and educate around those situations. Another way of thinking about sexuality is coming from, it, from an essentialist view. If you're thinking about sexuality um, from an essentialist um, theoretical uh, viewpoint, it's about the fact that there's only one way to do things that um, your sexuality is predetermined by your genetics or your biology or your um, <coughs> physiological mechanisms that you have in your body and, and therefore those things can't change. And so people have this idea that you are a woman and therefore this ABC is how you should be, right? So it, those kinds of ideas reinforce really heteronormative understandings. Um, but interestingly, some of the LGBTQI community actually can say, well, if that's the case, then I am natural and therefore I can't change either. And so you can um, use that uh, in another way. Another way of thinking about sexuality is um, Michel Foucault's work in terms of social constructivist views of sexuality. Um, and talking about how sexuality is fluid and therefore changeable, and um, the ideas that, um, that, that sexual drives and uh, identity are created around binaries of what is normal and what is deviant. Um, and so we'll look at the gender-bred person in a minute, and I think some people here will, will know this, um, this tool, which is useful for exploring gender, but... And so thinking about sexuality uh, in terms uh, <coughs> that it can be re redefined and reconstructed. And so uh, Foucault's work in terms of the history of sexuality has really been fundamental to thinking critically around the areas of sexuality. This little tool here, how many people have seen this um, wonderful little tool? You use this in your work, yeah? So it's really great in terms of... Um, Gender is one of those things that people think that they know... Um, uh, really well uh, and think that they can understand really well but in fact lots of people don't always <clears throat> and it's best understood if it's broken the gender's best understood if it's broken up into, uh, into parts around gender identity which is how you in your head define and understand your gender based on the options for gender uh, that you know exist 
And you'll notice, uh, like Foucault says, there's not a binary here, there's a continuum, okay? So you can, be, you can place yourself anywhere along this line. Gender expression, which is the ways you, do, you demonstrate your gender through your dress, your actions and your demeanour, and your biological sex around the physical parts of your body that we think of as either, either male or female. And if you look at this, um, this lovely little tool here, it really gives us an idea about there being continuum rather than a fixed one way or another. An either or is not on that sheet, it's a, an and or if, okay? So if we understand these things around um, sexuality from, um, from our little discussion just then, if we're thinking about the role of a primary school in terms of sexuality education, we've heard that parents, although they, it would be wonderful that they are the, the first educators around sexuality, but they find that, that a, lot, a lot of parents find that difficult. We've heard that it's mandated in the curriculum to be taught by schools. We've heard that there's some complexities around that. How are we going to do that? What do you think the role is of a primary school in terms of teaching sexuality education? And you can pop it in the chat box if you're streaming. Otherwise, have a little chat in your group about how can we do this? Go. <laughs> Okay, I think there's some really interesting conversations that I'm just listening to just close by me and I think, um, shall we see if anybody wants to share? I think this is a really interesting question to ask. What do you think the role is of um, primary schools in sexuality education? I heard some, do you guys want to share what you were saying? Because I thought it was interesting. Yes, would that be Okay. Pressure. Sorry. Um, we just talked about making children comfortable. Yeah. Um, giving them the language to be able to talk about their bodies and how they work and feel comfortable and confident to be able to do that so that they can have those conversations with anyone yeah. about anything mm -hmm. and feel safe to do that. Mm. Great. Thank you. Totally 100% agree. Yeah, we pretty much said the same thing, sort of just removing the taboo around... Um, sexuality education and I guess as a repercussion of that just preparing them for I guess further education in secondary as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think what we can do as primary educators and I think I say this to um, the primary uh, students who come through our courses here that please don't ever underestimate the importance of the work that you do at the primary level for setting the scene for our secondary colleagues to build on like it's fun, like it's really important that we we don't um, you know push health aside, which is, is, has happened for many years, of course. But if you think of in the last week or two uh, what's been in the news around young people's health and well-being, you know we we really have to I think you know I'll have my banner up here, but you know we have to rethink the importance of health education in schools, and this is just about one area. Okay, so I agree with you there. Anybody else? <clears throat> oh, we've got some over there. <laughs> we've got a few from uh, online. Um, we've got um, perhaps to build on knowledge and behaviours that may be taught at home. Um, and also to use a language that they can understand. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, and as teachers, these are the kinds of things that we do every day in our job is, you know, take the language that children bring with them and we build on it and we expand their vocabulary and their knowledge about any context every day. This is what we do. And so I heard over here, if I m might be uh, okay to share, about the normalisation of um, sexuality and relationships and thinking about this in a very normal way that is, it's okay for us to talk about our bodies or um, the complexities of relationships because relationships are difficult even from very small all the way to being very uh, wise should I say <laughs> or old relationships continue to be complex don't they and we, 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 we want to have sophisticated skills by the time that we're an adult to be able to navigate all the kinds of relationships we have whether they be platonic or intimate and so um, the role of the primary school education yeah, of the primary school is really important Okay, so if we think about uh, all of the things that you've just shared online and in here, 
I think a school's leadership has um, a key role to play in the development and implementation of a sexuality um, in a relationships education program. Um, in Victoria, this concept kind of is uh, extended to a whole school learning approach, which takes the perspective that a child learns the entire time they are at school, not just in the classroom. So if we, for, for, as an example, if we are challenging gender roles and stereotypes in our health education lesson in the classroom, we would expect that when a child goes out into the school grounds, that um, they would not be expected to do um, a, um, a gender stereotypical job or to, for, let's say, roll, line up in lines, girls and boys, or only the girls are here or only the girls are there. Satna, can I share your um, uh, example? Um, Satna was just telling me that she had been working at a school where in the playground they had gender days, so some days the boys were allowed on the oval and other days the girls were allowed on, so, until the children started challenging that um, that <laughs> situation about hold on a minute, I'm a girl, but I want to. Pl- those are my, those are boys, and those are my friends, and I want to play with them. But you're saying I can't. So you can see how quite easily um, um, there are, can be systematic things that are in place in schools that actually counter what we teach in the classroom around sexuality and relationships, such as ge- in challenging gender stereotypes. So we need to think in a whole school way about um, this context, not just um, not just the lessons that we teach in the classroom, but let's think more broadly than that. And I always find that when I'm working with young people that if you say to them, so we have this issue, or can you see any other situations in the school where perhaps we uh, have fallen into the trap of following gender stereotypes, they will tell you. And they will also, it's a perfect uh, opportunity for them to then think critically about how they could change that and work with the staff and the adults to um, to change the situation. That I find that young people, and I'm sure some of you will agree with me, that they have an innate sense of social justice. And if they think something is unfair, um, and maybe they haven't recognised it until you've done some teaching like this about and asking the questions about why do you think this might be in this way, and it's probably because it's a historical idea about, for example, lining girls' line and boys' line. Um, until we until we do this kind of teaching where we challenge some of those historical ideas they haven't thought about it and maybe some of the staff haven't thought about it too. So what we need to be doing in terms of thinking about this context is um, hoping that our school leaders are on board with us, um, that we develop a comprehensive program uh, rather than a you know a fly in and a fly out kind of situation where somebody comes in and does a session with our children and then they leave again. Uh, I firmly believe that um, teachers are the best people to be teaching sexuality and relationships education because you have the relationships with the children. And in a primary school situation, I know I'm in trouble, um, but I I also will work um, in um, partnership with outside organisations who work with me because I know my students and we work collaboratively together so we can work in that situation. Um, rather than a situation where somebody comes in and doesn't know the children and leaves again. So there's there's those situations. I'm sure you'd agree with that would be the ideal, right? As a group of outside organisations, I might be really big in trouble. Um, We need to think about programmes that are supported by the latest research. And the fantastic thing I was just sharing with this group here before is that for a long time, you know, I've only been in Australia for a year and a bit, um, but I think Australian resources are fantastic and I have been utilising the ideas in them for many years from New Zealand or from the Pacific where I've been working because you can take the ideas that are in the resources and you can attach them to your own curriculum document quite easily um, because they've been so well put together and so well researched and so and so well uh, funded in terms of developing those resources and so we're really lucky in Victoria to have such um, great resources available. So of course it also needs to be reported against in terms of um, student achievement around the VALS and um, uh, with health education you would only report it uh, when you have been teaching it Okay, so um, you don't have to report it you know, like twice a year like you do with PE, for example. You, you, you're just teaching, reporting on it when you're teaching it. 
And it should be part of a student's whole school learning experience so that as they move through the school, through primary and into secondary, that, they, that the contexts are being revisited at much more sophisticated as we, get, um, as we go up the school. <clears throat> I think one of the myths that's constantly, um, that constantly uh, reoccurs is the worry um, from parents that if we talk to children about these things, that this means that they will become promiscuous or more interested or curious around sex. And I think that comes from um, the old idea about sex education, whereas what we're talking about now is very different in terms of sexuality and relationships education. But I wanted to reassure people that um, WHO have done an extensive studies around this and there's absolutely no support for that myth. Uh, in fact, the, um, it show, the research shows clearly that those uh, young people that have had comprehensive sexuality education programs, they have um, postponed their initial sexual debut, I'd rather call it that, and, um, and also when they have decided to become sexually active, they have um, been more likely to use uh, contraceptives. And so countries where uh, children start their sexuality education at kinder and uh, where they have a very um, broad curriculum and liberal curriculum where there's no topics off limits, um, they uh, often, uh, the people and young people in those countries are often 18 or plus b before they decide to um, have their sexual debut. Interesting stuff. And so here we have our friend Louisa Allen again, who <coughs> argues that young people are often offered a non sexual identity in, in the culture of schools. And so she argues that schools fear sexuality education and refuse to recognise that children already have complex understandings of how sexuality operates in their lives, in their world. If we ignore young people's sexuality then, how do we educate them to view their sexuality positively and to make positive sexual decisions about their own bodies and the relationships they have, whether they be platonic or intimate as they mature? And we'll come back to this idea um, a little bit later um, in terms of thinking about children being non-sexual. If we think about the way that young people are being brought up in a sexualised world this, in this day and age, you know, we've got three-year-olds singing the lyrics of songs that they have no idea what it is they're singing about, but the imagery that they're watching in terms of the music that they're uh, listening to and the words that they're singing are very inappropriate perhaps for a three-year-old, but actually they're already singing them, they're already <coughs> absorbing them, they've already got messages and they've already got understandings around sexuality from being around that stuff. Just watching toy ads on TV, they've got ideas around sexuality about those things are for boys and those things are for girls, you know, so they've got complex understandings before they even get to us uh, at foundation level. <coughs> So, where are we at? To provide students with the, um, the best schools, skills, primary sexuality education must include developmentally appropriate discussions and information about the concepts of choice, friendships, gender stereotypes, personal safety, emerging identities, and much more. So that um, what we can do is provide a program that's, uh, again, meets the developmental needs of students at the time when they need it. That we normalise sexuality education right from the beginning when they're less likely to be inhibited about their bodies and the language um, uh, when, they're, when they're small. Let's think about gender and sexually diverse students and staff. This is one of those debates that we're constantly having. Um, in your group, or online, on your chat box, do you think it's hard for gender and uh, sexually diverse students and staff to openly identify at school? Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> What's the consensus at your tables about whether it's hard for gender and sexually diverse students and staff to openly identify at school? Okay, you've got something there. Um, most of um, the people online are saying yes, it is um, hard, um, unless the school has openly embraced things such as gender programs, which are still very controversial. Yeah. Yes, and we all know that there's been lots of controversy around the Safe Schools program and things like that. So, yeah, so I agree. Anything else? Anything differently? Yep. We thought that maybe it might be easier for a student than a staff member. Sorry, could you say oh, that sorry. again? We thought maybe it might be easier for a student than a staff member. Right, to interesting identify. point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay. So what we do know, I mean, is that uh, there's an alarming level of uh, homophobia and transphobia um, in the lives of young people in Australia, with about 80% in the um, writing ourselves in um, study, identifying abuse happening to them at school. And so we really have to address this issue. Um, when we look at the mental health of our transgender um, and gender diverse young people in Australia, we need to be thinking much more uh, explicitly and in a targeted way about how we support these students in our school. I th you know, I just I find it um, so interesting that if it was another issue, so uh, um, uh, of a, a an English a child with English as a second language that was struggling at school, we'd have all those supports in around them, but because it's around a gender diversity or a sexually diverse person, we we stand back and we don't address it in the same way, when in fact this is this is as fundamentally important. Some of the ways that we can start to think about how we might address some of these things in our sexuality and relationships education program and in our school practices are uh, that we make sure that we challenge any um, homophobic or transphobic language and behaviours that happen at school, for example, when a child says, oh, that's so gay. And actually not uh, necessarily doing the telling off stuff, but actually saying, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're aware that actually that's a really... Um, an appropriate thing to say, and these are the reasons why. Um, because I think as soon as you go into this uh, spot of you know, the telling off stuff, you get a defensiveness. And so the way that we, um, if we interrogate and tell off, we, we're straight away putting kids on the back foot because they're probably only saying something that's been reflected to them from somewhere else in their lives. And so this is an opportunity to be able to address this in a different way and say, you know, um, that some people are gay, and so when you say it like that, you're, what is it that you're trying to, to actually, this is a put down, and it's not okay in our, in, our, in our classroom and in our school, we look after each other, and we don't use words like that with each other, okay? Um, I think one of the lovely ways of being able to celebrate diversity in our schools is uh, all of you have got books on your... Um, <coughs> tables and those of you online probably can't see these but um, I went uh, into the library and the library staff have been brilliant and they've hunted out every single children's book that was possibly um, close to this context in terms of um, sexuality and relationships education and how we might use them in our classroom and so you could be using these um, uh, in your classroom uh, in any space in terms of literacy, in terms of looking at diverse families, in terms of uh, thinking about um, the ways people present themselves around um, gender expression, and those kinds of things. It's a beautiful book, Ben, the Boy Who Paints His Nails, and Love Makes a Family. Um, there's loads of books uh, around uh, on the table, so if you'd like to, um, at the end of the session, I'll put up a few titles on a slide coming up um, for those people online as well. I think a very simple um, uh, thing that teachers can do is, is ask what pronouns children prefer. Um, and I think this is a really, um, this can make a world of difference in children's lives. If you ask this question, if you are unsure, um, then you should just ask. And uh, it's pretty simple. 
I was hoping to wear my T-shirt from um, Rainbow Youth, but it didn't arrive in time, which had um, uh, she, her on. And it's, damn it. Um, <clears throat> So you can use books like this to give examples of sexual and gender diversity, but they, there's lots of times that you can actually include um, include examples within your teaching, not just in the health and, and PE domain, but across a lot of curriculum areas. Um, take the pressure off gender. Let's, let's move away from the girls versus boys kind of stereotypes that are out there, but actually we're all people in this classroom and we work together um, and, you know, and... That's it, really. <laughs> um, and, and really thinking about the school, the school practices and the systematic discrimination that happens. And so as you move higher up into the school, you can actually get young people to be critiquing those things in your school for themselves and actually um, doing a critical analysis of what happens in the school and then designing some critical action for things to change. And that's health education in action and that's when it's exciting because those kids that learn those skills become on become citizens who, who notice something that's happening in a community and then have the skills to be able to think about or well, how we're going to make a change here and that's that's for me what's exciting about health education okay so next question if all of these things are important what are we going to teach um, and when? When is it appropriate to teach some of these things? Is it Do we teach all of them right from the beginning or do we wait and teach some things later on? When you came in, you all got a, a little handout and I think if you're online, you've got an, a, a, a link to the handout. And this is a, a definition of a sexually healthy young person put out by WHO. And I um, adapted it slightly to use in my classes because I thought it would be really interesting for us all to... I'm not I'm going to ask you um, how many ticks you got, don't worry. <laughs> um, for ourselves to actually go down this, this list and think to ourselves, how well am I doing on this? There's some things here that maybe um, I let slip a bit sometimes or those kinds of things. But I think this would be a really useful tool to stimulate a conversation in a primary school staff meeting about if by the time students leave school at the end of high school um, and they've gone all the way through the schooling system, what do we think that we could be teaching at a primary school level that contributes to the point where by the time they leave school they can tick all of these boxes? Because they're, he they're entering into the world as, uh, as a young adult and how we're going to make sure that the things that we teach in schools make sure that all of the students have these skills. So if you have a little look, use this as a catalyst for discussion in your group, what do you think should be taught and when? And maybe there's some things on here that you think are perfectly uh, acceptable to be taught in a primary school. Have a, have a think about it and have a look at it. Okay. It's a pretty interesting document, isn't it? And um, I think there's loads of things we can teach in a primary school situation in terms of when we look at this, at this list. <clears throat> when you were looking at the list, did you think there was a host of things that probably could be um, started at a primary school level? Yep. So we are important as primary school educators in making sure that our young people have got all of these skills so that by the time they get to high school, our colleagues at high school can build on those, as I said before. I think this is a really useful document for us to think about when we are uh, navigating sexuality and relationships education with people who maybe don't, aren't, aren't, aren't fully aware of what we are talking about in this context because it's really broad, isn't it? And I, and I heard some conversations about some of these things are really tricky. And yes, they are. I mean, as a young person. So if they're thinking, but by the time you leave school, maybe you're how old, what, 17, 18? Um, then you're hoping that you can do things like negotiate with your parents. But I, 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 I heard you say that that's, some, some parents you can't ever negotiate with them. And that is that this is it. And the, you're in my house. This is the rule, right? Um, and... 
So when I've been teaching young people around being assertive or communication skills and things, I've, I've always said to them now, this may or may not work with you, with every person that you try this with, but these are skills that you can use. Um, there will be some people you'll decide that the relationship that you have with them is not worth um, continuing in this way, you'd rather maintain the relationship and there's other people that you all think well actually I don't want to maintain this relationship anymore and so so you have to negotiate in terms of your the strength of your relationship. Yeah and then if, you be, if you're an adult you can choose to have those relationships in, in whatever way you want. But when you look at this list there's plenty of things that we can be thinking about in terms of what we can do in a primary school situation. <coughs> So if we're thinking about foundation to two, the focus is on relationships, but when you start to look at the kind of topics that you might be thinking about in terms of sexuality and relationships education, there's a whole bunch of things here. Um, and some of them are you know, things that I think you, you would be perfectly um, uh, unsurprised about. And then other, part, other topics might be things that you think, oh, I didn't really think that that was um, sexuality education. I thought that was just uh, other health education. So discussing friendships and relationships and respect. Um, but those, these are the things that because sexuality is broader than sex, come into sexuality and relationships education now. Anything there that surprises you? You think that's pretty okay? Anything there that you would feel uncomfortable teaching, do you think? No? Yes? Beginnings of a baby, maybe? Is that the one? <laughs> yeah, the beginnings of a baby when the sperm and the egg join. There's some beautiful books around the room that give a really nice way. The thing that's happening at Foundation to Year 2 is that the children at that age are often um, surrounded by babies because, you know, the families are, are having more babies and they've got cousins and, um, and uh, those babies are part of their lives. And so it's a perfect opportunity to normalise the whole idea around the, how these things happen. I'm going to show you a little video um, that goes completely wrong around this uh, conversation with a parent, but it's a bit of a laugh, but it, it, there's a teaching point to it as well. Years three to five, you start to see how um, some of these uh, contexts are repeated again, and when you start to look at the curriculum in terms of um, achievement standards, you'll see that the verbs get more sophisticated, and so the way we think about them and the way um, the, the teaching ideas that we have alongside these things become more sophisticated. And then in upper primary, again, some similarities, but some differences as well. And I, I mean, I'm thinking that actually technology and social media could come down early, earlier. But I think what needs to happen in schools is that you as a school and the senior management team and teachers need to sit down and think, what are the needs of our students? What do our students need to learn? And that's the way you design, uh, I, I personally think a biannual program is, um, is the way to go because there's quite a lot in, the, in the, um, the content descriptors to cover. And it, w and it will be that you may do some of that teaching, of course, through cross-curricular types of units. Um, but you, you won't be able to necessarily get through all of them in, a, in, a, in one year. And so you have to think carefully about how are we going to do this, how are we going to um, spiral it up through our school so that there's interesting and complex discussions as they're getting further up the stream. Um. <clears throat> So what you can see is that um, a comprehensive sexuality education program provides sequential lessons from foundation to year six so that students can develop the ability to talk about relevant and age-appropriate aspects of sexuality without necessary em embarrassment. Building a language base means that they can communicate clearly and understand their developing bodies and emerging identities. By starting this education in lower primary, teachers can capture the uninhibited ways that students often talk about their bodies and ask questions before they become self-conscious. I've also just did a bit of a brainstorm um, of 
all the possible things I could possibly think of. The, I w it won't be an endless list, but like I've deliberately made this in text in text tense because there's actually two slides. But like I, I wanted to, uh, the words aren't necessarily important here, but what I wanted you to see was that there are so many things we could teach in this context if we think outside the box uh, in terms of... Um, the importance of the skills of, of relationships and sexuality in our lives. When I'm working with students, I'll get them to look through these lists and again ask, is there anything that you're really unsure of? But probably most of those things, people feel, actually, I could, I could probably do that. And so straight away, you're thinking, OK, if this is what sexuality and relationships education is, I can do this. It isn't scary. It isn't dangerous. We can move on this. OK, how do we include parents? Um, this is one of the things that I've done a lot of work with over the years in um, working with schools in the consultation and collaboration with parents around sexuality and education. And I think um, when I've run uh, these evenings, and I always take some of those activities that I'm going to do with the students with the parents. And as soon as we start doing that, a whole lot of stuff, the walls, come down. Uh, because they see that we are talking about sexuality and, and their fear is that we're talking about sex with their, with their precious child. And of course that's their worry. And so we, we start to, to, to break down those barriers and break down those walls by doing some activities just like we would do with the children. And straight away, um, when, we, when we talk about what our, um, our learning intentions are and what we're hoping that the children will... Um, learn from these lessons that, that they will make better decisions for themselves, that they'll be comfortable in their bodies, that their self-esteem will raise and, um, and that they will be able to um, ask people for help should they need help. Uh, those are the things that parents want as well. Um, I, uh, I know that some parents are concerned about uh, around um, diversity and the way that sexuality and, ed and relationships education deals with that. It is a human, uh, human right it is um, one of those things that we, uh, when we're working in government schools, need to be thinking about and need to be talking about. And the ways that we can address that are by um, saying that in some families that th these are the beliefs and in other families these are the beliefs. Some people of the Jewish faith maybe think this, other people of the Muslim faith th think this, other people don't think this. And what we need to do in our own lives is, is hear what all of these different ideas are and make our own decisions about these things you will be influenced by those people who you have the closest relationships with and you will be influenced by your parents. But there are other people who live differently in this society and this is about understanding that people don't all live in the same way. And so when we, we start to... We're not trying to say that our parents' values and beliefs are wrong. There's, there's absolutely no way that, that we're ever, ever saying that. We're saying that there's multiple ways of thinking about things and we're giving children uh, ideas around what happens in the world, and they make up their own, uh, uh, own um, decisions around those things as they get older and process and, and critically think around those things. So there's websites for parents to have a look at. You can put in anything you like in there. Um, there's books. There's this beautiful book called Talk Soon, Talk Often by um, Jenny Walsh. And um, I think teachers would be um, beneficial to read, to read that book as well. It's free online. Um, so just um, grab and have a look at that. It's, it talks about having multiple conversations, as you can tell, that this isn't just one thing where you sit down and think, OK, I've got to give them all this information all now, otherwise this is my one and only opportunity and it's gone. And so what we're having here is a conversation about how this whole school approach is connected in terms of our teaching and learning programme. We're connecting with our parents. We're con connecting with our community organisations. We've maybe got some outside organisations coming in and complementary to our programme and building on what we are asking them to build on to support our programmes. And we're also starting to critique and make sure that what we teach inside our classrooms is being is connected to the outside school environment in, in terms of um, they don't just learn one thing inside the classroom and go outside the classroom into the school grounds and those things disappear. If you get onto um, 
the DWECD website. There's loads of um, support for schools and teachers and uh, about sexuality and relationships education. You can just, I just took a screenshot there. Um, there's just superb support there in terms of resources, free downloadable resources, um, how to engage, ideas for how to engage with parents, thinking about um, curriculum and policy, assessment, uh, etc. So it's all there for you. You just need to um, jump in there and, and dig around with your school. And Think about um, the books that go into your library and the books that are available in classrooms that you can use to support your program. There's beautiful books um, out there and they can. it just very much normalises the diversity of the world around us in terms of um, a variety of families, the way um, that there's no one way to be a boy, there's no one way to be a girl, um, that it's okay to be different and celebration of diversity. This is an example of just, um, oops, uh, one of the free resources on that um, DWECD website, Catching On Early, and there's some really good ideas in here. You can pick and choose, of course, but the, I mean, the work's been done for you. Um, it's uh, evidence-based sexuality education. It connects really nicely with um, the Respectful Relationships um, resource as well and the personal and social um, capabilities there. Um, and you won't want to use all of it. Uh, one example of a lesson in there is around, um, for foundation, is uh, what are the parts of the body called? And where the children, I mean, parent, teachers can organise this in any way that they want. Of course, you can have cards and life-size bodies on, the, um, on paper or on the wall and you can mix and match or whatever way you want to. But thinking about, uh, we're probably more the same than we are different. Um, but when I use a, a, a text like this, I also ask um, children to think about what might be missing from this. Can anyone think about what might be missing from these diagrams? Anything? Pardon? <laughs> Student from last year's class. <laughs> Would you like to say it? The clitoris is missing. There's actually something else missing too, which I didn't pick up at all. So the clitoris and the anus are missing from this sheet. And so I'm always thinking about being critical of any resource you're using. But my big question here would be, why would we not have the clitoris on this diagram? Yes, but we've got we've got other things that are concealed, haven't we? Do you think it goes back to Ju um, to Louisa Allen's idea about how children are not they they have a non sexual identity and that um, missing discourse of pleasure and desire that we're not ever supposed to talk to children about um, pleasure uh, in terms of sexuality. I also think that the anus is incredibly important to know about in terms of. Um, uh, uh, the name of a part of your body uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, so, so be critical when you're using resources, even though they're fabulous resources, there could be some reasons why some things are left out. And I would ask that question uh, of children, say, and I would say, is there anything missing? Because some children in your class will know that there's such a thing as a clitoris. And of course, the only um, function of the clitoris is for pleasure. And so you've got that dilemma around if we start to talk about these things with children, then we do, do we move into dangerous places in terms of our um, what parents are going to say and those kinds of things. But, you know, how can we leave such an important part of the body out is my question. <coughs> you don't. Fantastic. I'm really pleased to hear it. Fantastic. Um, I just wanted to finish off with a few slides around answering questions because from my experience of working with teachers, this is one of the things that they are a little bit worried about in terms of what do I do if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? Or because, I mean, as the kids get older in primary school, they are seeing some things online that maybe as adults you might not have been in that place and seen as well. But also... Um, 
you know, how do you answer questions in a safe way? And so I've just got a couple of slides just to, to finish off this little bit here. Um, one of the first things, if you have a tricky or um, uncomfortable question that I'd, I'd get you to do is to think about how is it making you feel? <laughs> I, I call it a head-heart pulse check. Um, you know, what do you want to happen in terms of should I answer this question? It's like, where does it come? The thing that happens in primary schools, which I just think, you know, is, is just, it's lovely, um, and because they're not moving from one teacher to the next necessarily, is that you might have taken a lesson yesterday around sexuality, and then you might be in the middle of maths the next day, and this question comes out like, so what is an erection, you know, or something like that? So completely out of context and completely by surprise. Um, but because you're the teacher who took the lesson yesterday, you can actually know, so this child has been processing these, this information and they might, might ask you it out of the blue. So think about how it's making you feel. Think about the environment that you're in and is it appropriate to answer this question here and now? Um, um, if I answer this question to this child here, what's going to happen about the onlookers? I mean, were they part of the previous lesson? And like, is this, is, you know, is this, does everybody need to have this information? Or is this just that Debbie needs this information? Um, and so, so asking those things. A question that might come at you uh, could have been from something that they've seen outside of the classroom and, and could come at you completely out of uh, left field as well. And so you might be asking yourself, um, what's the messaging that they've got and where's it's coming from? So the next thing would be about a developmental check is like, um, is this the kind of thing that you would expect a seven-year-old or whatever age the child is to ask? And if it's not, then you might be starting to think, well, then how did this child know about this particular context that they're asking you or this word? Or I once had a young girl ask me about what an abortion was and when I started to, to talk to her about um, what, why she wanted to know, um, it was because she'd overheard a conversation at home and no one would tell her what was going on at home. And so she was, had overheard this word, she had no idea what it meant, and this is where the, the question came, because as a teacher, my goal is always to be askable and approachable. And I think that if I am not askable and approachable, then children will go and ask someone else and maybe get some misinformation. And so it's, for me it's fundamental about um, being those things. <clears throat> so asking what's developmentally appropriate in the answer that I give here and what can I do to affirm this, this child that um, what they've asked me is okay. Um, or if there's a situation where they might say, well, so-and-so said this isn't all right and so-and-so says it is, how can you acknowledge that people have different understandings and different beliefs and that's okay? I always try to investigate rather than interrogate <laughs> when a child asks me a question um, because I think uh, I mentioned before that when we interrogate, we, we're unlikely to be the next person that they, they come to for, uh, to ask a question of, and I want them to do that. And, I'm, and I might be thinking to myself, what can I do to make sure that whatever the, whatever the question has been, whether there's some activities that I need to think about incorporating into my program so that, because I, I, I usually if one child has a question, the other children are probably interested in the same sort of thing as well. So um, if there's a bias that I hear or if there's um, some some topic that comes up as a question, I'm often thinking about how I can include those in my next classrooms. So just some, um, uh, another, the last thing is, is to formulate some difficult questions and practice the responses. And I do this with my students and it's always pretty interesting. It's like they look at the question of, of, that have actually been asked of, of primary school students and they go, has a primary school student really asked that? <laughs> Yep, <laughs> what would you say? And so when you're developing your programs in your schools and you, and you might be worried about um, questions that come from your community or um, if you're a beginning teacher and you're um, thinking you want to do this, what might administration ask of you or what might your parents ask of you, think about what those difficult questions might be and think about how you might respond to them because it's time well spent in terms of um, thinking through the kinds of responses that you might need to have. Because when you're put on the spot, you can't always um, 
answer straight away. And I'll say to children, look, I'm not actually quite sure, or I need a bit of time to think about that, but I'll come back to you, and that's okay, you know. But you have to, you have to go back to them. You can't just dodge it <laughs> from there. Okay, so I want to just, um, just this is just a very, it's just a, a couple of minutes long. This is how um, Julia Sweeney answered some questions of her of her daughter when she asked some questions around sexuality, and it's it's a little bit funny, and I thought it might be a nice way to finish. But let's just have a have a little look of that. Can we um, press play there? We didn't check that, did we? Yep. Daughter, um, Hold on. And we'll when just she pause that eight last year, This um, mouse she was is so. Sorry. Sorry. She about frogs. And we were at this restaurant, and she said, So basically, frogs um, lay eggs, and the eggs turn into tadpoles, and tadpoles turn into frogs. And I said, Yeah, you know, I'm not really up on my frog reproduction that much. It's the females, I think, that lay the eggs, and then the males fertilize them. And then they become tadpoles and frogs. And she says, what? Only the females have eggs? And I said, yeah. And she goes, and what's this fertilizing? So I kind of said, oh, it's this ec extra ingredient, you know, that you need to create a new frog from the mom and dad frog. And uh, she said, oh, so is that true for humans too? And I thought, okay, here we go. I didn't know what happened so quick at eight. Um, I was trying to remember all the guidebooks and all I could remember was only answer the question they're asking. Don't give any more information. <laughs> So I said, yes. And she said, and where do, um, where do human women, like where do women lay their eggs? And I said, well, funny you should ask. We have evolved to have our own pond. We have our very own pond inside our bodies. And we lay our eggs there. We don't have to worry about other eggs or anything like that. It's our own pond. and." Um, that's how it happens. And she goes, and how do they get fertilized? And I said, well, um, men, in their, from their, through their penis, they fertilize the eggs by the sperm coming out, and you go through the woman's vagina. And so we're just eating, and her jaw just drops, and she goes, Mom, like, where do you go to the bathroom? And I said, I know. I know. How we evolved. It does seem odd. It is a little bit like having a waste treatment plant right next to an amusement park. <laughs> Bad zoning. But she's like, what? And she goes, but mom, um, you, but, but men and women can't ever see each other naked, mom, so how could that ever happen? And then I go, well, and then I'm like, put my Margaret Mead hat on. Um, human males and females develop a special bond. And when they're much older, much, much older than you, and they have a very special feeling, then they can be naked together. And she said, um, Mom, have you done this before? And I said, yes. And she said, but Mom, you can't have kids, because she knows I adopted her and that I can't have kids. And I said, yes. And she said, well, you don't have to do that again. And I said, and then she said, but how does it happen when a man and a woman are together? Like, how do they know that's the time? Mom, does the man just say, is now the time to take off my pants? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> that is exactly right. Exactly how it happens. So then we're driving home and she's looking out the window and she goes, Mom, what if just two people saw each other in the street, like a man and a woman, they just started doing it, would that ever happen? And I said, oh no, humans are so private, oh. And then she goes, what if there was like a party, and there was just like a whole bunch of girls and a whole bunch of boys, and there's a bunch of men and women, and they just started doing it, Mom, would that ever happen? And I said, oh no, no. It's not how we do it. Then we got home and we see the cat and she goes, how did, Mom, how do cats do it? And I go, oh, it's the same, it's basically the same. And then she got all caught up in the legs. But how would their legs go, Mom? I don't understand the legs. And I was like, she goes, Mom, everyone can't do the splits. And I go, I know, but the legs, and I'm finally I'm like, the legs get worked out. And she goes, but I just can't understand it. So I go, you know, why don't we go on the internet and maybe we can see, like on Wikipedia. So we go online and we put in cats mating. And unfortunately on YouTube, there's many cats mating videos. And we watch them and I'm so thankful because she's just like, wow, this is so amazing. She goes, what about dogs? So we put in dogs mating and you know, we're watching it and she's totally absorbed. And then she goes, 
Mom, do you think they would have on the internet any humans mating? And then I realized that I have taken my little eight-year-old's hand and taken her right into internet porn. And I looked into this trusting, loving face and I said, oh no. <laughs> that would never happen. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And and so we see how complex and <laughs> easy it is to get yourself um, tied up in knots when we haven't thought through how we might answer some questions. <laughs> I think it's really lovely. I think it's like you, you're genuine, you're trying to give information, but somehow it kind of just um, didn't quite go the way, the way she wanted. So in conclusion, what I'd really like to say is that um, children in primary schools have the right to receive a comprehensive sexuality and relationships program that not only provides them with facts and information, but also to ensure that they have the skills to talk about and understand their bodies, um, their varied relationships, as well as the space to explore and shape their attitudes and beliefs about the world and how they negotiate their place in it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Deb, for sharing your insights. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure everyone will agree it was very useful and there was lots of practical ideas that we could put into practice. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, does anybody have any questions for Deb? No. Get my steps up. <laughs> um, I just have a question about that worksheet you were showing us before. What age group would you target that at because you're mentioning like the clitoris and anus and well I haven't taught this yet so I really don't know like which age group to um that's actually designed for foundation to year two that activity and um so it's out of the um catching on early resource but my my criticism of it is that they have got two bits of the body that are missing so they've got everything else but not those two bits and I don't know quite whether there was a conscious reason that they didn't put that in or I mean I would ask children when I'm doing that activity is there anything missing these people down here facilitate sexuality education in schools and they would you, would you like to say something uh, around how you because you say that you don't miss the clitoris out we'll just get the microphone so that people who are streaming <coughs> can say something so we with can I talk about the anus first? Sure, so yeah. we talk about the excretory system uh, with males and females. So we include the urethral opening and the anal opening. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about the reproductive systems. And we talk about, with female bodies, we talk about the vulva and what's um, parts of, what parts of the vulva and what's contained in the vulva. And we talk about the clitoris being a very sensitive gland that's contained within the vulva. Right. And this is with what age students? This is with year fives and sixes. Year fives and sixes, yeah. yeah. So the issue I saw with that picture... Oh. Just the issue with that picture and putting the anus on that is, where would you put it yeah. because of the view you're seeing? I think you could have, like, if I was to, to redo that or the, um, the department was to redo that, we'd have another little circle with, you know, um, like they had there already... I suspect that the reason it wasn't, wasn't in there is because of that missing discourse of um, pleasure and desire in terms of the clitoris being solely for pleasure. And so I think that that's probably why it's not there, but I think it's important to be there and, and, and for the reasons that you're, you're saying, but also the anus is really important in terms of it's another part of our body <laughs> and we need to have the correct language to be able to describe our bodies um, you know, we don't call an elbow, we don't just not talk about an elbow, you know, like it's just another part of our body, right? That would be very humorous. Um, we have, uh, uh, we've got a question on live stream. Okay, so we've got a question from Georgia. At my primary school, our sexuality education classes were split into boys and girls. Do you believe this is appropriate to create a more comfortable environment? 
I think this is one. This is a really typical question that is asked really, um, really often. I think that there are probably times in your um, sexuality classes where you might have some times where you are separated, but I don't think it's beneficial to have children separated all the time. I think that um, girls have brothers and, and may or may not have partners who, who are male and equally um, uh, with the boys. Uh, so I think it's important that everybody knows all the information. But they may, there may be some context that they might feel um, more comfortable talking in a single sex situation, in which case, you know, you, you're the people who know your students. Um, and I think, you know, some of those decisions in the past have been not necessarily made for thinking about the students' needs, but more about the teacher comfort. So I think you have to ask yourself why you're doing that, and if you can give yourself a good rationale, then that's you know the students and you know the context that you're teaching, and so you make those professional decisions. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Deb. I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to formally close the session. But if there's any further questions, I'm sure Deb wouldn't mind having a quick chat as she packs away. Um, so I just want to thank you all for coming again. And thank you, Deb, so much for getting out of your sick bed and sharing your insights. We're very appreciative. Glad I got through with a voice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just one quick thing. Our next uh, free HPE seminar is on May the 8th. Um, that will be led by uh, Good Bernie over there and myself. Um, and that will be uh, more aligned with the movement and physical activity strand. And we'll be focusing specifically on game sense and uh, teaching through themes. Um, so if that's something that would interest you, please pop it in your diary. Uh, that'll be relevant for both primary and, and secondary HPE teachers. Um, so thank you again. Uh, all the best, safe drive home, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.